Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, last week I kind of breezed through the uh, the first uh, the first lesson where I did a survey of the Book of Revelation, and then I. Uh, I kind of went through chapter 1 really quickly. So in light of that, I did make some copies. I did teach that lesson a while back, and I went more in depth. So if you want a little more information, you can have a free CD on that. Today, we're going to talk a little about the seven churches in the book of Revelation. And uh, just to review, just for a minute, the, uh, the first five words of the book are the revelation of Jesus Christ. That is the title of the book. Now, if you've got a King James Version, it says the revelation of St. John the Divine. Well, John wasn't divine, and it was a revelation about who Jesus was. So that's the title of the book. The word revelation... I, uh, I don't know if it's on that outline I gave you. I might be. Yeah, the word revelation is apocalypsis. We talked about that, that last week. It's an unveiling and uncovering of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the reason that's significant is because the more you see Jesus in his different character, his aspects, his different ministries, the more you are transformed. See, that's an effortless thing. You are transformed by great gazing into who he is, and you are transformed from glory to glory. And so that metamorphosis, that transformation is significant. So that's what God does, does for us. So in this book, you see Jesus in many different personages. He's the Alpha, the Omega, the Almighty God. Today he's going to be the head of the church, he's the lion, the lamb, he's the bridegroom, the coming king, the morning star. There's all these different pictures of Jesus in some aspects of his ministry. He's even seen as the lamb slain in heaven. So in the mind of God, the sacrifice of Christ is ever present. And that's kind of significant for us. So anyway, this is the only book in the New Testament that commands a blessing. And when I, I saw Jimmy today, he said to me, I'm blessed. And you know what that word, I put it down because I just saw this the other day. That word Barak, the name of our wonderful president, Bar means son, like Simon Bar Jonah. Bar is son, and Ak means an open hand. The son of the open hand. Now think about Jesus, the son of the open hand. He opened his hands, they were nailed to the cross. He was cursed so we could be Barak rock blessed. Amen. So that's what that word means. It's just a little something I thought I'd throw out there. Now these when we look at this book it's, it's important how you look at it. It's literally true. The, it, the literal sense if it, it makes common sense. If what he's talking about is a tree, it's a tree. If it's an earthquake, it's an earthquake. A war is a war. A famine is a famine. Some things are obviously symbolic. Like a woman standing in the sun with the moon and the stars around her. The things that are obviously symbolic, sometimes the Bible interprets it for you. If it doesn't, then it becomes difficult. Then it becomes conjecture. But what I'm saying is most of the time it's literal and it's sequential. I talked about that last week and I do even have that, that CD on a brief survey. So if you want that, you can have that too. The Bible for the most part is self-explanatory. You know, it says it's the glory of God to conceal a thing, the honor of kings to search it out. So it's a scripture interpreting a scripture. That's the main tool that we're going to use here. The church, the word is ecclesia. It means called out ones. You're called out of darkness. You're called into light. The church is called the bride of Christ. There is a church universal. That's everyone in the world that believes in Jesus. In the past, some of those people are in heaven. That's the church victorious. People that are alive here on earth, we're his witness. We occupy until Jesus comes. Jesus as the bridegroom and the church as his bride. That is a tremendous revelation. At the end of this book of Revelation, there's a marriage supper of the Lamb where Jesus is the bridegroom, we are his bride. You know, if you ever read the Song of Solomon, that was never one of my favorite books. It was poetry. It was kind of like, you know, it was out of my realm of the way I studied. But if you really look at it, I've looked at it closely in the last few years. It's a story of a king, King Solomon, and his Gentile bride. It's a picture of Christ and the church. And if you read it closely, what you see is how the king, Christ, sees his bride. He sees her as beloved. He sees her as without spot or blemish. He sees her perfect and flawless. Now that's a difficult thing to grasp, but I'm going to tell you something. That's how God sees all of us. Yeah. You are perfect, 
complete lacking nothing Amen. and you say well, where, 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 did, where did you come up with that <laughs> Hebrews 10 14 says you are perfect forever through the one sacrifice of Christ that's how God sees you you are complete Colossians 2 says all the fullness of deity rested in Christ in bodily form and we have completeness in him so you're complete you're done and you lack nothing God will provide all your needs according to his riches in Christ not according to your obedience so this is his perspective that's how Abba I use the word Abba because that's the Hebrew word for, for daddy that's what Jesus called his father he called him Abba he spoke Hebrew that's his point of view and it's important to begin to see yourself like that Jesus prayed in John 17 father you love them talking about the disciples as much as you love me I don't understand it but he said that and so so we have this grace that he's given us and through that grace you reign in life so you get this image you are a royal priest you're a king you're an ambassador you're a conqueror these are all the descriptions of how God sees us and when you can superimpose that picture of how God sees you that image it changes the way you live it changes the way you think you look that God says I will forgive their iniquities and remember their sins no more that means all your faults all your failures are forgiven your weaknesses and then he says I will remember your sins no more no more in the Greek is this word ume which is like the strongest negative that they could ever write that Paul could ever write I will never ever ever remember your sins so what does that mean that means in God's mind as far as he's concerned the blood of Christ covers you and he doesn't bring it to your remember when you go to heaven they're not gonna flash your life before you and every bad thing you ever did that would be horrible that's not gonna happen because of the blood of Christ Amen. because we have redemption through his blood well anyway back to the back to the lesson chapter 2 I got off on a tangent forgive me seven churches seven seven's a number of completeness it's in the book of Genesis creation took seven days you know what's interesting about creation I'll give it to you through a grace filter Adam was created on the last Last day the last thing that God created was Adam when Adam came to life he was born into a perfect finished work everything was all done he did not do anything he just received the Garden of Eden as a gift Amen. the first day of his life was the Sabbath rest the seventh day he spent with God communing and speaking with him that's a way that we're to live we're to live as though everything is done and then through our fellowship with God able to move in life seven churches seven churches located in Asia Minor they're in a circle John is on this little island called Patmos he's in exile it's about 90 AD all the other apostles are dead he's the only one left they tried to burn him in oil they were unsuccessful he was come out unscathed the Romans didn't know what to do and so they threw him on this little rocky island called Patmos and across from Patmos there's these seven cities in a circle starting with Ephesus so John gets a series of visions seven visions of heaven seven visions of earth and he describes it in the book of Revelation but before he describes all those visions he describes these seven churches now these seven churches are real they existed at that time so it the letter meant something to each one of those churches they're historical the second thing is they're representative churches if you looked at these churches the way we're gonna look at them they represent church history from the early apostles all the way to today seven different periods of church history there are also seven periods seven types of churches that you might see in the world today you might see a church like Ephesus in the world today you might see a Philadelphia or a Smyrna you might see these churches in the world today and lastly they mean something to us personally they have a personal application so they'll speak speak to us personally I'll try to look at those facets as we go through them the first church the first church is the church of Ephesus the church of Ephesus was a very wealthy church it was a capital of a Roman province they had a large library they had a banking system they had a gigantic temple to Artemis which was a which was a Greek God also Diana the Roman God it was one of the seven wonders of the world so they had this was a really beautiful city it was a free city that means that they had no Roman soldiers stationed there they were self-governing and the word Ephesus I put this on your outline it means beloved 
beloved. This was a church established by Paul. It was an apostolic church. It represented the first generation of Christians from the time of Christ to about the time of John. It was a church birthed in power and in miracles. Timothy was the pastor there. The Apostle John, after he got out of exile, went to that church. There's a, there's a story in, in church tradition that, that Timothy asked John to speak at one of, the, one of the services. John got up, gave a two-word sermon, and sat down. And history tells us all he said was, love one another, and he sat down. That's the only recorded sermon that we ever heard of John the Apostle. But this was that church. Mary also was believed to have gone there and have died there. I believe she died. If you want to have a different theology, that's, that's up to you. So this church is in the book of Acts. And it begins, it says, To the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. So the seven stars, are, are, we, we realize that in the first chapter, that represented the messengers or the pastors of the church. The lampstands were the churches himself. This is Jesus. He holds the seven stars and the seven lampstands. And now he begins speaking to this church. He says, I know your deeds, your hard work, your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people and that you have tested those who can't claim to be apostles but are not and have found them false. So this is a pretty good church. They seem to be doing everything right. And then he says, you have persevered, you have endured hardship for my name and have not grown weary. Now this is written 30 years after Paul established the church. So they're mostly second generation Christians in this particular church. And then Jesus goes on and says, Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you have at first. So something was missing in that church. They had sound doctrine. They've rejected false teachers. However, something was missing. They, they lost their first love. Well, what, what happened there? See, you have to understand one thing about Christianity. Christianity is experiential. That means you experience. Ephesians says that you may experience the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. Love is not a theological concept that you describe in terminology. It's experiential. And they had lost that experiential part of Christianity. Peace is experiential. You know, it's something you feel in your heart. The same thing with joy. So when you begin to look at Christianity, we use words to explain it. We call those words doctrine. But for the most part, being born again is an experience. It's something you experience. They lost that experience. They lost their first love. So they're doing all these works, but they're not really motivated by the love of Christ anymore. They've, they've moved into programs and all these other different things. But what you're going to understand is when God gives you grace, that produces faith. That's how you're saved. By grace through faith, He gives you grace that produces faith in your heart. And then it says you are His workmanship, created to do good works. Amen. Workmanship. Greek word, poema. It actually means masterpiece, where we get the word poem from. So, in, in light of that, you are a masterpiece. You are a work of art. Did anybody ever call you a piece of work? <laughs> you can tell them that you are not a piece of work. You are a work of art. Because that's what God calls you. You see, it's, it's important to have God's point of view. Pastor was telling me something he was working on. And that's what it had to do with. How do, you, how do you think like God thinks? How do you see like He sees? So anyway, so they, they lost that expression within one generation. They lapsed into works. So they're, they're saved, but now they, they've lost their grace-motivated life. Now it's all self-effort. So what do they need to do? On that outline, I think I put the word metanoia. That's the Greek word. That means they needed to repent. They needed to change their thinking, change their mind, realize what had happened to them when they were born again. The Hebrew word I put on there, teshuva, means return to grace. That's the Hebrew word for repent. And so this is what they needed to do. He goes on and he says to them, What verse am I in? <laughs> verse 5, yet I hold this against you, forsaking your first love. Consider how far you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. What did they do at first? They just received the grace, the love, the peace of God, and that became the expression of their life. They lost that. If you do not repent, change your mind. I will come into you and remove the lampstand. He just said, I'm going to take the anointing right out of your church. 
You know, you know what makes a church when you sing the praise and worship? Now, we only sang three songs, but I, but I can tell you that there is a real presence of God here Amen. in the music. And so that's what makes a church. And what Jesus said, I'll take the lampstand, I'll remove the illumination, I'll remove the anointing from you. But you have this in your favor. You hate the practice of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. The Nicolaitans, they're an interesting group of people. They, this was their theology. Let us sin that grace may abound and that God may be more glorified. So the more we sin, the more grace we get, and the more God is glorified. That was their doctrine. But I'll tell you this, that grace operates through righteousness. Amen. Grace is not a license to sin. If you are in a practice that's against God's word, you are no longer under grace. Grace says no to ungodliness, Titus 2 says. So if grace is really in your life, then you, you, the Nicolaitans, that's a whole thing that doesn't work. It's, it's not. It, it's, it's immorality. It's incorrect. And then he says, whoever has ears, the King James says, singular ear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life. Tree of life. You know what that is? That's Jesus. I'll bring him back into fellowship with the tree of life. It's like when you have communion. That's fellowship with Jesus. His body healed you. His blood declares that you are forgiven, cleansed, and victorious in life. Amen. Communion is not about me. It's not. It's about his victory. You declare, you remember him, his victory until he comes. That's what it was all about. And so the tree of life is partaking of him, which is in the paradise of God. So what do we get from this? You are God's beloved. That's the personal application of that church. That was the first church, the apostolic age. The second church, Smyrna, to the angel of the church at Smyrna. These are the words of him who was the first and the last, who died and came to life again. So Smyrna. Smyrna basically has to do with a suffering church. It comes from the word myrrh. Myrrh was a, like a, a spice or a fragrance that when you crushed it, it gave off like a perfume, a, a, like, a, like a beautiful smell. It's like the anointing of the Holy Spirit. You know, to some people, the Bible says, you are the fragrance of life. When you get around them, they say, you're like the aroma of God. To other people, you're like the stench of death. <laughs> you know? I mean, that's what Paul said. He said, some people, they just love me. I'm the aroma, but other people, they can't stand me. And, and so this, this myrrh speaks of the releasing of the Holy Spirit. These people here, they were persecuted. This is the persecuted church. This goes from about 100 AD and there's some overlap here, maybe a little before that, to 313 AD. And it's exactly that year that there was a tremendous change. So, so this was the church under the Romans. The Roman emperors, there were about 10 major emperors that basically they persecuted the church. They threw them to the lions, they burned them at the stake, they crucified them, they took their property, they imprisoned them. This was a time of tremendous persecution as far as the church was concerned. And so Jesus said, I am the first and the last, the Alpha, the Omega. That means he has the first word in your life and he has the last word in your life. He's sovereign, he's in control. He died, he came to life again. He says, I know your afflictions and your poverty, yet you are rich. I know about the slander of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are of the synagogue of Satan. So, how does God view riches? Wealth is not measured in dollars as far as God is concerned. It's measured by perseverance, by faithful endurance. They were poor, yet as far as God was concerned, they were rich. They were being persecuted by Jews who, who uh, Jesus says, are of the synagogue of Satan. Satan's an interesting word. I put that on there. The Hebrew word Satan is Hasatan. In Hebrew, he was a prosecutor in a court who accused you of a crime for breaking the law. That's what the word meant. And that's what Satan does even today. He brings the Ten Commandments up to you and says, wow, you coveted. You, you lied. You had lust. This, that, and it, you had anger. You violated the Ten Commandments to try to bring guilt into your life. The question would be, if that's true, where did all that go? What happened to the guilt? What happened to the Ten Commandments? The Ten Commandments brought condemnation and death when it was first given. Paul says that in 2 Corinthians 3. The Ten Commandments were nailed to the cross. When Jesus died, he fulfilled all 
all the law, the ceremonial law, the civil law, and the moral law. The Ten Commandments were nailed to the cross. So somebody gets really upset. Oh, God, what am I going to do? I don't have the Ten Commandments anymore. Well, I can tell you this. Grace far surpasses the Ten Commandments. Because the Ten Commandments says, don't be angry. Great Grace says, be kind. Pray for your enemies. The Ten Commandments says, don't commit adultery. Grace says, treat everyone like your brother and sister. Ten Commandments says, don't steal. Grace says, give, and it shall be given to you, and you'll be blessed. Amen. Ten Commandments say, don't lie. Grace says, speak the truth in love. Be edifying. Speak to the potential in a person, even if you can't see it. Sure. Did you ever see somebody that had like zero potential? Well, God wants you to, because if they're Christians, Christ is in them. They have potential, so you have to speak. That's what, that's what grace does. Grace doesn't covet. If, if somebody's blessed, if Paul won the lottery, I'd be the first person over there to congratulate him before we go on our trip. You, you, know? <laughs> you have to find them. See, grace that's what grace does. So grace far exceeds the law. So don't worry about the Ten Commandments. You are not under the law. You are under grace. Romans 6, 20. You are not under the law. You're under grace. So that, that's the way God sees things. So anyway, this is, this is the church at Smyrna. They're suffering. They're persecuted. The synagogue of Satan. Do not be afraid of what you are about to suffer. I tell you, the devil will put some of you to prison to test you. You will suffer persecution for 10 days. Some people think the 10 days is not 10 days. It refers to the ten evil Roman emperors that went on for about 200 years. He said, be faithful even to the point of death, and I will give you life as your victor's crown. The victor's crown. That is the crown of life. That's what a conqueror wore after he won a major battle. He would, they would give him this crown. They had a never give up attitude. So you might see this church in the world today. Persecuted churches in some countries, maybe not in the United States. You know, if somebody looks at us the wrong way, we think we're persecuted. But in other countries, you know, if you were a Muslim converted to Christianity, your family might have a funeral for you and like, and like ostracize you. You know, there's a lot of countries where Christians are actually suffering. Suffering is the only negative thing, persecution, that, that we need to endure. We don't need to endure sickness because by Jesus' stripes we're healed. Amen. So you don't need to endure that. You can claim your victory in that area. But for persecution, basically it's just to endure if it happens. Jesus said, blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you. He said, rejoice and be glad. Great is your reward. So that's our attitude when something happens. It's all right, I get another reward. So if you can think like that, that's a good thing. So that's the church of Smyrna, the suffering church, the next church. It goes on. Let me just finish that. Whoever has ears, let him hear what the Spirit says to the church. The one who is victorious will not at all be hurt by the second death. The second death is judgment. We, we don't have a second death. We died in Christ. It's over. Now you are alive. When you die, you just are raptured into his presence. There is no punishment. There is no suffering. There is no second death. Death means separation. Second death means eternal separation from God. Church of Pergamum. Pergamum. What's that about? Pergamum, the word means married to the world. So something happens in 313 AD. One of the Roman emperors, Constantine, has a vision. He's going into battle. He sees a cross before him. And under the cross it says, by this sign you will conquer. So he has this supernatural vision. He has some type of God experience. He gets saved. Supposedly, I read his history, he had some life issues, which we all do. He had his, his wife and his son killed. But that's a whole other story. The fact is, he believed he had a salvation experience, so he mandated Christianity. When he conquered people, he said, you're going to get baptized. If you don't get baptized, we're going to kill you. And so everybody became a Christian. And when they became Christians, they took a lot of their practices into the church. You see, and so the church became merged with the state. It was church and government was all one, was joined together. So Satan could not defeat the church with persecution. So now he decides, well, let me join the church. I'll be a little Eleven, I'll work from the inside out. I will corrupt it from within. So to the angel of the church of Pergamum, Jesus says, these are the words of him who has a sharp, double-edged sword. That's the word of God. The word of God is a sharp, double-edged sword. You know why it's double-edged? Because to the believer, it justifies you. To the unbeliever, it condemns you. The word of God to an unbeliever condemns them. Because by that word, you will be judged. 
How are we judged? We're judged by faith in Christ. That's the work. You believe in Jesus as far as God's concerned. At that point, you are justified by faith. It is a gift of God. To an unbeliever, though, God's word will stand in judgment against them. He says, I know where you live, where Satan has his throne. So they lived in a pretty evil place, almost like a Sodom and Gomorrah place. Yet you remain true to my name. You did not renounce your faith in me, not even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, who was put to death in your city where Satan lives. So there were, there were martyrs there. This, this was just a terrible place to live. Antipas, he overcame by the blood of the Lamb, the word of his testimony. He became, he was victorious through the victory of Christ. You know, if you think about that for a minute, I had heard a teaching not too long ago that I thought was really amazing. And it said that when David killed Goliath, Goliath was a type of Satan. When he killed him, he cut off his head. We never know what he did with the head. But the Jewish tradition says he took that head to Jerusalem, the city that he founded, and he buried it in a hill. And that hill was Golgotha. That's where it got its name from, from Goliath. Golgotha, where Christ was crucified. So on top of the hill where Christ was crucified, under his feet was Goliath's head, a symbol of Satan. And so even though Satan's had his throne here in Pergamum, he was already a defeated enemy. And Jesus goes on and he says, Nevertheless, I have a few things against you. Now this is a church that's merged with the world. And each one of these churches, now they have groups of believers and groups of unbelievers. They're overcomers and there's non-overcomers. And some of the non-overcomers were not even believers. He says, these are, these, there are some among you who, who hold to the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to entice the Israelites to sin, so that they, they ate food, sacrificed to idols, and committed sexual immorality. So there's an allusion to this Old Testament prophet named Balaam. He was a person who had a greed-motivated ministry. He wanted to prophesy for money. And when an evil king came and said, I want you to curse these Israelites, God restrained him. He couldn't do it. But what he did do is he told that evil king, Barak, he said, this is how you can defeat them. Get them to eat food sacrifice or idols. Commingle with them, with your people. Cause them to commit immorality. And they did. And this was a man who basically, he points today to ministry that's motivated by greed and corruption. This was what the church looked like in that, in that era. A lot of the pagan practices had crept into the church. There were, there were times when they, they had um, indulgences. They would collect money. They would begin to worship saints and angels. They would even begin to worship Mary at that time. They were very financially concerned. At this point in time, they had their priests, they, they commanded them to be celibate. And the reason was because when the priest died, they didn't want him to leave the property to the family. It was a financial thing. So this church was really a fine, this was this doctrine of Balaam is a financially based thing. Another incident in his life occurred when God sent an angel to kill him. And as the angel was approaching Balaam, Balaam was on a donkey. The donkey saw the angel, but Balaam didn't, and the donkey stopped. Balaam gets off the donkey, starts beating the donkey, and the donkey then speaks in an audible voice. It's like a miracle of speech. And tells him, why are you doing this to me? I just saved your life, you know. And so God, even with Balaam, extended a little grace. You have to understand that God's grace is always there. He holds out his hand all day long to a disobedient and obstinate people. So if you're disobedient and obstinate at times, then realize that God is holding out his hand even, even to you. So anyway, back to this church. This church married to the world. The church and the state are one. This is a church that also embraced the Nicolaitan doctrines too. Goes on, it says, Likewise you have also hold to the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Repent, therefore, otherwise I will soon come to you and fight against them with the sword of my mouth. He's telling them, begin to change your thinking. You know, I have, I, when, when you're separated from Jesus, he's not your friend. He's your enemy. I'm not talking about believers. I'm talking about non-believers. I'm talking about corrupt ministry. These were people, the Pharisees at the time of Christ, the Sadducees. They, 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 they was greed motivated. It was pride motivated. To those people, Jesus spoke the harshest of words. You know, you are of your father the devil, your brood of vipers. And so he's trying to get these people to repent. And he'll try to like, just shock them back to reality. Whoever has ears, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. To the one who is victorious, I will give some hidden manna. 
kidding me? He man appoints to Christ. Jesus said, I'm the bread that come down from heaven. Your, your forefathers ate manna in the desert. But I am the bread that comes down from heaven for a man to eat and never die. Hidden man, a hidden revelation of who Jesus is. I will also give that person a white stone with a new name written on it, known only to the one who receives it. This, is, this concept is an interesting thing. The concept of the white stone. Sometimes the white stone you were given, if you were acquitted by a judge of a crime, they gave you a white stone that verified that you were not condemned and you were not guilty. Another interpretation says it was given to as an award, like a gold medal at their Olympic Games. The final one, which I think is the best one, said it was a white stone that was cut in two and that a bride and a groom exchanged it at their wedding. And it was like a symbol that we use like as a ring. So the white stone is really a picture of like Christ and the church. So that was a, that was a thing that I thought was a little interesting. Go to the next church, Thyatira. Thyatira is a church that means ruled by a woman. This is the mother church. This is a time when Roman Catholicism just dominated the world from 600 AD to the time of Martin Luther, 1517. The, uh, the word, the word ruled by a woman, a mother church. A lot of their teaching folk began to focus around Mary more and more. She was considered a, a perpetual virgin, yet the Bible says she had four sons and at least two daughters. She was said to be without sin, never sinned, a sinless life. Yet she said, when she prayed the Magnificat, she said, my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. So she needed a Savior too. You see, and they also had doctrines that said she, she never died, she ascended into heaven. They began to call her the co-redemptrix with Jesus. If you've ever seen some of the paintings and the statues from that era, Mary is this big, gigantic woman. And Jesus is in her arms, but he's like, like small. You know, it's like they're trying to create an image. And this became the mother church. This is the church at Thyatira. Many of the false teachings came in at this time concerning purgatory, traditions, her immaculate conception, which believe, they believe she was born without sin, perfectly. Based on the teaching, she could have been your savior. But we know that none of that is not biblical. But this is what Romanism was based on. A lot of it was just false teaching that just ensnared people. So these are the words of the church to the angel at Thyatira. The, son of, the words of the Son of God, whose eyes are like blazing fire and whose feet are like burnished bronze. I know your deeds, your love and your faith, your service and your perseverance, and that you are now doing more than you did at first. So there's a remnant in this church that's doing some good things. You know, if you look at a lot of these churches, you're going to realize that they're not, they're not all pagans. There's rem God always has a remnant of believers in all his churches. And he says, nevertheless, I have this against you. Tolerate that woman Jezebel. Jezebel was a woman in the Old Testament who was evil. She, she, had, she, she hated Elijah. She, wanted, she killed prophets. She had her own priesthood. Did things her own way. And, and she was just a picture of an evil woman who had a domineering spirit. And by, the, by her teaching, she misleads my servants into sexual immorality and the eating of food sacrificed to idols. I have given her time to repent of her immorality, but she is unwilling. Even to Jezebel, God's saying, I gave her an opportunity to, to repent. If you read the history, I can't even tell you, if you read the history of the church from 600 AD to 15, you would be shocked of the murders, the executions, if you owned the Bible. You were executed. The Bible was written in Latin. You weren't allowed to read it. There, there, were, there were popes that were, were boys. There was intrigue. There was bribery. It was like the mafia. I mean, there was no difference. This was the church through the Middle Ages. And they, they had times when they, you know, they weren't as bad. But for the most part, this was what the church was. It was a greed-motivated ministry. And it existed like that for almost a thousand years. So he goes on and he says, I will cast her on her bed of suffering and make those who come in adultery with her suffer 
suffer intensely until they repent. So once again, we see God holding out his hand to a disobedient and obstinate people. I will strike her children dead. That's brutal. I can't interpret that verse. God bless you if you can. Then all the churches will know that I am he who searches the hearts and minds and I will pay, repay each of you according to your deeds. Now he's talking to unsaved people because he's not going to repay us according to our deeds because all our deeds were forgiven. All that's left as far as he's concerned are all the good things you ever did. The gold, the silver, the precious stone, the wood, hay, and stubble, that's all gone. That's all gone. He doesn't record that stuff. Okay? When you sometimes you sing a song, God, you know, don't remember my sin. Well, you're asking him to do something that he's already done. It's already done as far as your sins are as far as the east is to the west. They're cast in the sea of forgetfulness. So anyway, he's talking about the groups in that church who are not really Christians. Now I say to you, to the rest of you in Tyre Tyre. Now these are the believers. To you who do not hold to her teaching and have not learned Satan's so-called deep secret, I will not impose upon you any other burden except to hold on to what you have until I come. So he's speaking to the remnant there. To the one who is victorious and does my will to the end, I will give authority over the nations. They will rule them with an iron scepter and will dash them to pieces like pottery. This is like a reference to the second psalm. Just as I have received authority from my Father, I will also give that one the morning star. Whoever has the let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. So this was the church of the, of the dark ages, the middle ages. What does that mean to us? That means you're going to be careful about greed, motivated ministry, things you watch on TV. You know, if somebody says to you, you know, are you suicidal? I have this wonderful book for $50 that I'm willing to send you. Please don't kill yourself. Buy the book first. You know, that's greed motivated ministry. That's not freely you receive, freely you give. It totally violates every concept that Christ ever taught. Imagine if he said, before I give you the loaves and the fish, you know, everybody has to pay. If you can afford a little more, I please put in a little more. To the ones who are evil within this group, please don't come forward. You know, when Jesus fed all those people, I bet you there was homosexual people there. I bet you there were people that, that were thieves and robbers and, and people that did evil things. He fed them all. See, God's grace is spread to all. You just have to receive it. Amen. You know, I mean, he just, he gives it. You just got to receive it. So anyway, this was the church in that age. Then something happened. Martin Luther got saved in 1517. And so becomes the Protestant Reformation. The Protestant Reformation is uh, the next the next church which is Sardis. If I can find Sardis on here. <laughs> I'm losing my notes. To the people of the angel of the church of Sardis. Let me look in the back of this one. No. I think I lost the paper. Hang on, hang on. Stay with me. I'm going to have to do an incredible thing. I'm going to have to read out of my Bible. You have it? Oh, we just have the notes. Okay. We won't read all the verses. To the angel of the church of Sardis. The word Sardis means escaping ones. So what happens at this time? Martin Luther gets saved. He reads one verse. He's a Roman Catholic priest. He reads a verse, the just shall live by faith. And he's born again. He has a supernatural experience. And he begins to see all the different things that the church was doing wrong. Like the indulgences, the infallibility, all the different doctrines that they taught. Purgatory. And he decided to nail these to the walls of a church in Germany. All his disagreements. There's like 95 of them. And he nailed them and he was excommunicated. And so began the Protestant Reformation, the called out ones. To so the church at Sardis, it appeared to be alive, but it was dead. Because the presence of God wasn't there. You see, so God told them, he said, escape. And so Martin Luther escapes and all the Protestant denominations begin to be formed. The Lutherans, the Baptists, the Methodists, the Episcopalians. But there wasn't really a presence of God in these churches. People were born again and then they were put into a works-motivated system. 
a lot of what you see today. You're born again, and you better work like hell if you want to keep saved, okay? If you excuse my language, but that's what they teach. You better really work. You gotta, you gotta sweat. You gotta labor. You gotta fast. You gotta memorize. You gotta travail in prayer for hours. If you don't do all these things, you're gonna surely be lost. A lot of churches teach that. What is the work of God, Jesus said? The work is to believe. You believe, and then under the power of the Holy Spirit, you will be able to do everything God wants you to do, and it will be effortless. You will not labor and strive. God will give you the grace to do whatever you need to do. So all these denominations formed. This church at Sardis had a form of godliness, but they didn't have any power. So what were they? They were formalism, ritualism, professionalism. There was no life there. They didn't pray for the sick. There was no Holy Spirit. There was no presence of God in their church. But yet there were Christians there. You see, there were Christians in that church at Sardis. And so, time goes on. The next church that, come, that comes along is the church at... The church at Philadelphia. <laughs> I'm, losing, I'm losing myself here. The church at Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. That's what the word meant. Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. This is a church that there's no, not one negative thing written about. To the angel of the church of Philadelphia. I found my notes. These are the words of him who is holy and true, who holds the key of David. You know what the key of David is? David praised God no matter what was happening in his life. No matter what. He was being chased by King Saul. It didn't matter. He was still praising God. He refused to do anything evil when Saul was chasing him. He had a chance to kill him a couple of times. He refused. He was a person that no matter how difficult his life was, even when the baby died after he committed adultery, he went to the temple. He prayed to God. He prayed seven days. The baby still died, but his relationship with God was never broken. That is the key to David. He says, what he opens, no one can shut. Talking about Jesus. And what he shuts, no one can open. I know your deeds. I have placed before you an open door that no one can shut. This was a church that was motivated by love. Experiential. They loved people. They loved each other. They did what John said, love one another. And, and so this is what made God open doors for them. When God opens a door for you, that means his favor is upon your life. Whatever you do, have the expectation that God is going to bless you. Amen. Have that expectation that God can do exceedingly abundantly more than you could think, ask, or imagine. According to his power. Not according to my faith. According to his power. Have that expectation. You know, if God wants to bless you, expect more. You know, there's nothing. I believe he wants people, you want to use the word greedy. He wants people to be greater, like a child. If you gave a child a piece of candy, he'd take it. If you gave him a second, a third, a fourth, he'd take every one you gave him. There'd be no stopping. That's the attitude that he wants us to have. You see, and this is the way this church was. This is the attitude of the open door. I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who claim to be Jews, though they are not, but are lies, I will make them come down and fall at your feet and acknowledge that I have loved you. See, the God of peace has crushed Satan under your feet. He's the God of peace. He's not the God of war. What that means is when you have an attitude of peace in your heart, Satan has no hold on you. He has no inroad into you. That's why it's the God of peace. That's why Jesus, when he died, Goliath's head was under his feet. He defeated him once and for all time. So he's telling this to the church of Philadelphia. Since you have kept my command to endure patiently, I will keep you from the hour of trial that is going to come upon the whole world to test the inhabitants of the earth. So this church you see in the world today, a church that the love of Christ is dominant. That the fellowship is dominant. He's saying, I'm going to protect you from the hour of trial. You're going to be like the person that lives in Psalm 91. You rest in the secret place of the Most High. There's no fear. You're resting in Christ. What he says in that Psalm is that, that the arrows that fly by day are going to miss you. The pestilence that stalks in the darkness is not going to harm you. You're going to trample the lion and the cobra. At the end of the Psalm, it says, because he loves me. I'm going to bless him. I'm going to be with him. I'm going to give him a long life. I'll honor him. That's what it means when God's going to keep you from the hour of trial. How do you get there? You let the love of Christ rule in your heart. Let that be the dominating factor in everything that you do. 
And he says, I am coming soon. Hold on to what you have so that no one will take your crown. The one who's victorious, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God. Never again will they leave it. I will write on them the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, which is the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven. And I'll also give them a new name. You know, God got a name for everybody. You know, he's got a pet name for everyone. I believe that. I don't know what it is. Some of you may know, may know your pet name. But I believe he has a special name for every person based on their character and their personality. So this was a church during this period of time from 1750 to 1900. What happened is there were tremendous awakenings in the United States. There were great awakenings, great evangelical things that happened in this country. There were times when they would go into towns and cities and everyone would get baptized. This happened in the 1700s, in the 1800s. And in 1900, there was an outpouring of the Holy Spirit that happened in the United States, that happened in England, happened in India, and all at the same time it happened. And that was where we are now, in this last day church, this church of Laodicea. Laodicea means rule of the people. Leo is people, Dicea is rule. This was a church, now this is the last day church that's kind of corrupt. This isn't God's witness on earth today. This is the corrupt church that he's looking at here. And this exists in a lot of places. This is a church that's real, that's got a reality in the world today. So the church, the angel of the church of Laodicea, these are the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. So this is the church from 1900 to today. This is a church where people vote on what they like and don't like. You know, Pastor Mario, you talked about the cross the other day, and that's a little gruesome. You know, we voted in the congregation and decided from now on, we don't want to hear the word blood anymore. We're offended by it. And if you don't do that, we're going to fire you. This is what Laodicea was. It was a, a rule of the people. They heard something they didn't like. They said, okay, that's it. We don't like it. And that's the end of that. There were certain things they wanted to hear. And, and that was the church. That was the, and there were churches that exist like that today. You know, certain things you can say, certain things you can't say. This, this city, Laodicea, historically, it was a, a very wealthy city. It was a banking city. They had gold. They had, they had a severe earthquake there. It was so bad that the city was destroyed. The people were so independent, they rebuilt it themselves in 61 AD. They had an independent spirit. They had an independent spirit. They had no need for God. They didn't, they didn't need him in the church. They, their clothing was made of this precious black wool that they sent all over the world. They were famous for it. They had, they had medical schools. They had all these different things there that were very positive things. They had a natural cure for like forms of blindness. This was all in that city. Nothing good is said about them. This is that last day church. They had the form of godliness but they denied its power. They were church basically on wealth and prosperity. And they had these springs, these aqueducts. They came down from the mountains and they came into the city. And, and originally the water was, was very warm. It was maybe from like, like thermal springs. And by the time it got to the city, it wasn't really drinkable. It was like lukewarm. It was nice if you wanted to take a bath, but you couldn't drink it. The water was kind of tepid. It was nauseating. If you drank the water from the city, you would vomit. And so what happened was that the, the condition of the city had crept into the church. And so this is what you're going to see here. And it goes on, and Jesus says, I know your deeds, they are neither hot nor cold. You know what that means? They had, they had thermal spas that were very hot. So if you had aches and pains, you jumped in there and you felt better. And they had cool, refreshing springs also in different parts of the city that you could drink. So he's saying, I wish that you were refreshing or that you were, had some blessing, healing in you that, you, that you were a blessing to people. I wish you were either one or the other. He said, I wish you were hot or cold. Not the way we would think it. He said, I wish you were refreshing, encouraging, or you provided health for people. You say, this is on their church doctrine. They have a statement, a church statement. On their wall of their church, it says this. I am rich, I have acquired wealth, and do not need a thing. That was what they believed. They didn't need God. They were self-satisfied, wealthy people. This is the prosperity doctrine taken to the extreme. It was a money church. It was like a country club. 
And Jesus then says to them, but you do not realize, and he uses these five words, you are wretched, pitiful, poor, poor, blind, and naked. They were repulsive to him. And even though they were rich naturally to Jesus, they were poor. They were blind, even though they had these ointments that helped people see. And they were naked, even though they had these beautiful garments in this city. See, the, the, it had just crept in, this nauseating, lukewarm, self-satisfied Christianity. And then he says, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire. He's talking about God's word. He's talking about the pure word of God that can save you so you can become rich. That's what God's word does to you. If you're poor, his word can make you rich. And white clothes to wear, that speaks of the righteousness of Christ. White is purity, so God doesn't see the, the blemishes. And you can cover your shameful nakedness and put salve to put on your eyes so you can see. He says you're really blind. They were blind to their condition. These people in this church, they were blind. And he says, those that I love, I rebuke and discipline. You know how God rebukes you and disciplines you? It's when pastor gets up and he teaches. You see? It's not, it's not to hurt you. It's to teach you. God's ways are not our ways. God's thoughts are not our thoughts. His ways, God's ways are always very gracious, very kind, very loving. Our ways are, boy, I better really work. I better toe the line. But God doesn't think like that. He just says, I want you to love me, and you, that will cause you to obey me. Jesus said, if you love me, you will obey me. You see, and so, and so he's rebuking them. He's correcting them. He says, be earnest, repent. Change your mind. Change your thinking. And then it says, here I am. I stand at the door and knock. What an image. Jesus is not in this church. He's outside knocking and saying, please let me into your church. There's no presence of God. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. That's, fellow, that's divine fellowship. That's divine fellowship. This is what he says to every person. This is, they use this verse for salvation. I stand at the door of your heart and I knock. Let me in. To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne. Just as I was victorious and sat down with my Father in heaven, whoever has ears, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. But I don't want to just leave you with that, with that, that Spirit. Because at the same time that God did that, there was an outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the earth. The wheat and the tears. This is more tears. But the wheat grew. And there was the Pentecostal movement, the charismatic movement, the prophetic movement, this grace revolution. God is moving throughout the whole world, supernaturally and dynamically. I believe that the last day church will be greater than the first day church. So you're seeing this happening at the same time. And so what is God's word to us in, with all these churches? We need to realize that just like each one of these churches, what does it say to you? That you are beloved, like Ephesus. That's how God sees you. That there may be some insult, some suffering in your life. God wants you to endure. Be careful of being married to the world. Be careful being caught in denominational Christianity. Be careful of greed-motivated ministries like Balaam. He's saying be aware that these things exist, that the false doctrine is out there. Realize that if you're in that condition, you can, like Sardis, you can escape and be motivated like Philadelphia. Let the love of Christ motivate you in your life. And, and the last day church, just realize that the wheat and the tears grow up together right in the last days. And the question that we ask ourselves always, I put it on the end, is God in your church? And I can just sense by the presence of God when we did the praise and worship that he is indeed in this place. You know, a lot of times in the Old Testament, Jacob saw a stairway to heaven. He wrestled with God. And when he woke up, he said, God was in this place and I didn't even know it. It was like the Spirit of God left Samson. He lost all his strength. It says he didn't know it. When Jesus was 12, he stayed in the temple and Mary and Joseph left. And for three days they walked and they didn't know Jesus wasn't with them. You see, so sometimes you can be oblivious to those things. But it's important to stay tuned to that and to realize that God is with you, He's for you, and that you are His beloved. Amen, amen. I do have that CD from last week if you want it. It's on Revelation 1, which is a little better, a little more detailed than what I did. And I even have a brief survey thing. Amen. Did you want it?